very good morning. I'm just going to talk about uh, hill of vision in glaucoma. That's how do we interpret visual fields in glaucoma. I'm just going to be in the basics. I think yesterday we have discussed lots about how we look at the progression and how we uh, attribute a particular disease to the fields. So uh, coming back to basics, we first need to understand the field of vision that we have checked is all right or no, and how do we interpret that. So um, I guess you, all of you know that when we have to read this printout that comes in front of us, we have to divide it into the zones. And I'm going to go zone by zone for that. So what is zone one in the printout that you see is about the patient and the test data. Although this looks very basic, but it is important to check that which field you are reading, because sometimes if we are not very careful, we may be mixing the patients and inter interpreting wrong for a given clinical finding. Also, it is important to understand that what is the age of the patient because we are talking about the relationship with normative database. So the date of birth has to be all right. Pupil diameter, visual acuity, and refractive error correction, each of them has an importance while we are checking the visual field. Because if you are checking the uh, perimetry on three millimeter pupil or six millimeter pupil, that makes a difference. So if you have to compare the fields, you need to know that what was the pupil diameter that was used last time. Similarly, we also need to understand that which strategy we have used for uh, evaluating a particular field and we need to select according to the disease. So uh, what is the fixation that we have used in a given patient? What is the stimulus size? What is the test pattern? Because it's important to pay attention to each detail and customize our test to a, according to a given patient. Now we also need to know that whether the patient has performed well. Before reading a printout, we need to know whether the patient has done well. And there are certain things in the printout that you can see when your uh, report comes to make you understand that whether the test was performed well. So first and foremost is the foveal threshold. So as the test begins, the first thing that we check is the foveal threshold. So unless the uh, foveal threshold is checked all right, we cannot look at the field further. I will uh, elaborate on it in later slides. And also we have to look at the reliability of the field. So there are reliability indices in zone two that give you correctly that what is the fixation monitor uh, showing us, what is the fixation target use, how many losses we had, false positives, false negatives. Uh, and the gaze track at the bottom of the printout that you see tells us that how well the patient has performed. Let's go uh, one by one. So when we talk about the foveal threshold, that's the most sensitive point that the machine checks. Now, uh, if our foveal threshold is not matching with the visual acuity, that means there is some problem. So the first test that a machine does is a foveal threshold. And if that is not all right, we should not proceed with the test. The further testing should be done only afterwards. So if you look at this particular uh, uh, thing, the foveal threshold here is 27 and the visual acuity is 618. So that is matching with your visual acuity. Similarly, if you go onto the lower printout, the foveal threshold here is 36 and the visual acuity is 66. So if it is not matching, that means we should not be proceeding with the testing further and we should be repeating the foveal threshold. Next thing that we look at is the fixation losses. Now there are two ways the machine checks the fixation losses. I'm sure all of you know what is the Heil Karaku method. So machine presents the stimulus to the blind spot 5% of the times and then uh, checks the response to the patient. So by the patient. So if the patient has responded to the stimulus presented on the blind spot, that means the patient is not looking at the fixation. So that is taken as fixation loss by the machine. And that is directly given as fixation loss on this, like this particular printout shows you 10 out of 16. So that is not reliable. The second way the machine checks that the whether the patient is fixate, fixating on a fixation target is the gaze track. And that is what the graph that you see at the bottom. And also you see uh, the gaze uh, on the screen when the patient is looking at the center. You see this kind of a picture where you can see the pupil of the patient and a light reflex. So that has to be in the center. Now, if the patient is looking at the fixation target uh, all right, then you will see the reflex in the center. If the patient is uh, not looking at the center, then this light reflex would be deviated. That is how it will look if the, uh, the patient is looking to the right. So that is continuously has to be monitored on the screen by the technician and the outcome of it is given by the printout as a gaze track monitor. Now how do you read this gaze track monitor? An up deflection on a gaze track monitor tells you that the patient has moved eye away from the fixation target. And a small deflection up 
suggest that it is a small refixation movement. The down deflection tells you that there was a blink or the closure. So now you know how to read this uh, bottom graph. So if this is the graph that you uh, see at the bottom of the uh, printout, that means the patient has done really well. The second one is also acceptable. The third one, when you see the initial part, the patient has not been uh, able to fixate, but later on has understood and sort of continued the test well. Now, this kind of a graph, if you see, so actually the fixation, there are fixation losses throughout the test. So this kind of a test is not acceptable and is not reliable. And if you see down deflections all the time, that means the patient's eye has been closed or the patient has been sleeping throughout the uh, test. So uh, it's important to check that before we actually proceed on to uh, interpreting that particular field. The subsequent uh, parameters for reliability are like false positive, which are quite uh, clear that if a uh, patient has not seen the stimulus but still press the button, that is counted as false positive and up to 20% are considered acceptable and more than 30% you get the uh, printout showing you the double cross, so you know that is not acceptable. So this is how high false positive response field would look like. So this is something that we call as white scotomas. So you see that in this, uh, uh, this particular field that you see that a lot of white spots there which are called as white scotomas. The other findings that you will see in this kind of a printout is the elevated false positive catch trials in your reliability parameters, white scotomas and uh, glaucoma hemifield test would be positive. The mean deviation or pattern deviation would be in plus. Otherwise, when you see the mean deviation, that is usually in minus. And the pattern deviation plot would be worse than the total deviation plot. So this is characteristic of white scotomas or trigger happy patient. So again, this is not a reliable field. Second parameter is false negatives. That's the converse. That means if the patient has seen the stimulus but not press the button. Now, how does the machine know that? If the machine has presented the stimulus to the same point or to the edges, adjacent point and the patient has responded and the next time patient has not responded, so uh, the machine gets to know that this is a false negative. So there is a small catch there. What happens in a uh, false negative test when there is advanced glaucoma, sometimes machine misinterprets as false negatives. So uh, when we are talking about the advanced glaucoma patients, then the false negative the high false negative percentage is also can be acceptable. So this is how a false negative uh, thing would look like. So you have a, a, a nice looking disc, but a grossly depressed feel. But if you look at the parameters, the uh, false negative percentage is high. So that is what is false negative. Another example, if you see the disc like this and a peripheral scotoma like this, you have to check the refraction. So this is the ring scotoma that is uh, uh, there in this patient because of the high plus power that, is, uh, that has been used. And this is called rim artifact. Again, an uh, unreliable field. Everything being all right, but still you see this. However, clinically you feel that the patient doesn't have anything and the disc is normal. So you still tend to repeat the test and uh, sometimes the patient can do better. And that is uh, the thing that we see mostly in learning curve. The learning curve may not be as simple as that. Sometimes the patients can have a bad learning curve like this. Now this is the fields, uh, consecutive fields of one of my patients who is quite an educated lady and uh, uh, English speaking and understands well. But she took almost eight months to reach the baseline. And I kept thinking that the nerves are absolutely healthy and the field has been worsening, but ultimately we could uh, get to that. So it's not the question of how much the patient's uh, uh, understanding ability is but some of us are uh, find it difficult to perform the fields so we have to do have to give that leeway and pay attention to the clinical details now this is classical clover leaf defect that is uh, i'm sure all of you know that so initial uh, phase of the test the patient responds well and then gets bored for, for the test or uh, forgets to respond or gets tired then you get this kind of a defect so initial stimuli are all right but later on the patient doesn't respond now, what about this field? Everything looks okay. Uh, gaze track is all right. False negative, false positives are all right. And uh, uh, everything looks all right here, more or less. So what do we see here? Anyone? There is no blind spot here. So the machine has not uh, been able to map the normal blind spot also. So that is again a uh, unreliable field.
So those are the things that we need to look at and there are certain logistic things that be keeping the lens in the center, especially when you have a astigmatism uh, or cylindrical power in a patient. So this is a field done by one, uh, one of our technicians where who has a cylindrical power. So we purposely kept the, uh, this thing centered. That was for teaching for my residents to show that how it affects. So if you keep a centered field uh, lens, trial uh, lens, this is how the field comes. And the second field is when the, uh, when the same patient performed and the lens was not centered as I showed you in the previous picture. So that can also affect the uh, outcome of the field. So there, there are multiple criteria that we need to look at that whether the field is reliable or no and then we proceed on to um, looking at how the field is to be read. So we come to the zone 3 which is the raw data that gives you the threshold sensitivity at each point which is quite uh, evident by these numbers. And this is the grayscale which corresponds to the numbers and it tells you in comparison to the normative database that uh, uh, what is the, uh, how much is the deviation from the normal. Now, uh, the, this is the chart that you see in each field, so it tells you how uh, the darker the, as you go, the more abnormal uh, is this particular point. Now, total deviation plot, that is the point by point difference from the expected value for age-related normals. So that's the importance of date of birth that we enter. So the machine uh, checks these points in comparison to the age-related normals and gives you the numeral numerical plot above and the um, uh, the grayscale below. So be with that, you can understand that how different are these points as compared to the normative database. Now, when we go to the pattern deviation plot, this reveals focal defects after adjusting for the overall depression or elevation of the hill of vision. So machine takes the seventh best point, deducts from the total deviation plot and then gives you the number and the, uh, and the grayscale which tells you about the uh, localized scotoma in a given field. So a normal field would look like that where the total deviation plot as well as the pattern deviation plot both look normal. If you have a generalized depression, you will see lot of abnormalities on the total deviation plot, whereas the pattern deviation plot would be more or less normal. And if there's a localized depression like this or localized scotoma, you will see the same kind of defect in the total deviation plot as well as on the pattern deviation plot. If you have a generalized depression with a hidden localized scotoma, then you will have much more abnormality on the total deviation plot and lesser abnormality on the pattern deviation plot. Now, coming to zone 7, so if you look at the global indices, this gives you overall um, overview of the field uh, reduced to a simple numbers. So as to give you an overall idea that how depressed is a particular field. So this has VFI, mean deviation and pattern standard deviation. Now what is VFI? This is a visual field index which expresses the visual field status as percentage of a normal age, age adjusted field. So 100% is supposed to be the normal and as you go down 0% is supposed to be abnormal. So the advantage of VFI is that greater weight is given to the points closer to the fixation as to, so as to adjust for ganglion cell density, density. So it is more relevant to glaucoma fields rather than the neurological fields and it is less sensitive to generalized changes. So uh, VFI tells you in exactly in percentages that how much is the visual field index of a given patient. When we look at the mean deviation, that gives you an overall picture of the total deviation plot. That is the numeric expression of overall deviation from the normal. And uh, the p-value tells you how abnormal it is as compared to the normals. So positive numbers increase supra-threshold, ne negative numbers uh, indicate the infra-threshold field. When we look at the pattern standard deviation, that is also der derived from the total deviation plot, but it tells you how much is the irregularity in a given field. So that is why it is representative of potholes in a given field or a localized scotoma in a given field. Short term fluctuation is something that is used for full threshold programs and now we hardly use it because we use CETA standard. So there the machine checks these 10 points the second time to look at the intra-test variabilities and that is what is called as short term fluctuation. And when you correct the pattern standard deviation for the short term fluctuation that is what is called as corrected pattern standard deviation. It is not available for CETA programs. Now let's go to zone 8. That is a glaucoma hemifield test. So it checks the upper field with the lower field so as to give you the comparison. And the outcomes are given in the plain English language that whether it is normal or borderline or outside or there is a generalized 
uh, reduction of sensitivity or if the field is not reliable so that you can have an overall idea. So just to summarize to tell you how you look at the glucometers field or what are the Anderson's criteria. So if you have pattern deviation plot with three or more uh, non-edge points, if you are doing a 24-2, we even include the edge points with P less than 5%, one point with P less than 1% or a cluster. If the PSD is less than 5% or if the GHT is abnormal, that is considered abnormal and that is what we use for Anderson's criteria. However, mind you that these are Anderson's criteria for an abnormal field. Having Anderson's criteria does not mean that patient has glaucoma, you have to correlate it clinically. And I think that has been emphasized enough by our yesterday's speakers as well, that it is important to pay attention to the clinical details. Now, just few examples for you. This is a uh, disc where you can see that there is superior, superior uh, rim is almost absent, there is a notch and you look at the field and you see a classical inferior scotoma. So that is what matches with your clinical findings, so we can consider that. Similarly, this uh, particular disc, what do you see? So here is a, a superior and inferior NFL defect and you look at the field, there is almost like a biarcoid scotoma. Just one minute more I am taking. So uh, this is another field now, if you look at, it fulfills all Anderson's criteria. GHT outside normal limits, there are uh, points which are depressed, okay, and uh, uh, PSD less than 0.5%, so fulfills all Anderson's criteria, but unless, hold on, you have to look at the clinical findings. So what is the clinical finding here? There is a choroidal coloboma there, which is responsible for that field effect. So this is not glaucoma, although the, the field printout fulfills the Anderson's criteria. Another picture where you have uh, scotomas here and uh, GHT outside normal limits, PSD being less than 2%. But if you look at the nerve, that is a normal myopic disc giving uh, and peripapillary crescent giving rise to enlargement of the blind spot. So it's important to pay attention to the clinical details. Again, a classical glaucoma, sorry, <clears throat> on field. That is the inferior uh, arcuate scotoma. But if you look at the... Um, all the Anderson's criteria being fulfilled. If you look at the fundus picture, this is what is causing this particular field effect. Now, this is a field that I wanted to show you. This is something which, is, which looks different from the previous field that I showed you because this is done with a size 5 stimulus. So sometimes when the patients have visual acuity, say less than 624 or less than 636, it is difficult to use size 3 stimulus and we have to use size 5 stimulus. But we don't have normative database uh, for, uh, for this five, size 5 stimulus, so you do not get those statistical comparisons with age-related normals. And you get a perimetry report like this, where you get the absolute threshold sensitivities of the points in a given patient. But that is also important uh, to see, uh, so that you can compare the current field with the subsequent field to look at the progression. Now this particular uh, uh, patient uh, report is uh, size 5 stimulus but basically he has a retinal issue that is why the visual acuity is less and that's how we mapped his field because the disc was difficult to evaluate being myopic. So uh, when we are reading out a automated perimetry printout we need to remember that it is important to understand the technology and is important to understand why, how the machine gets these mul multiple data points and the grayscales so as to be able to interpret according to our clinical findings and in uh, relation to our own patients. So it's important to have those clinical skills and develop that clinical acumen to be able to use these sophisticated techniques for the management of our patients. Thank you for your kind attention.